Hi everyone, 12.30, we're gonna get started. Uh, it's John Snyder here, another edition of Newton Wellesley Medical Group Lunch and Learn, welcome. Thanks for coming, feel free to have your camera on or off. We got you muted, um, please uh, make sure you stay on mute so it doesn't interfere with the talk. Uh, today, we're really happy to have uh, Dr. Jay Simon here, one of our premier orthopedic surgeons, who's gonna be talking to us about managing shoulder arthropathy. And Jay, if you can give me the next slide. Of course, we're still getting CME for this. The code today is H-O-P-T-O-H. Wow, that's like H-O-P-T-O-H. I'll put that in the chat box toward the end. Next slide. As I like to do, I just want to tease uh, the next couple of weeks. Of course, next week is Thanksgiving, so there'll be no lunch and learn. Um, but the following week, we will have uh, Dr. Ellie Tomzek, one of our newer plastic surgeons on staff, um, who talked mm -hmm. to us about uh, breast implants as well as the following week, how to answer all your family's questions about hip and knee replacements, a primer for the holidays. I love that. Andrew Fre Andy Freiberg uh, is gonna be talking to us about that as well. Um, with that, I will be quiet and Dr. Simon will take over. Jay, thanks for doing this. And um, I'll come back on to answer questions at the very end. Awesome, John, thank you. So everybody, welcome to uh, another Lunch and Learn series. Uh, the topic today is managing shoulder arthropathy. For those of you who have been in lectures with me before, I apologize that you came back. Uh, for those of you who are new, um, you'll, you'll learn why. So being on a Zoom lunch and learn is going to be like this. Everybody can see the screen. That's me in the top left talking. And there's going to be a bunch of black screens, a bunch of people falling asleep, and a bunch of people who are bored out of their minds. This is an interactive discussion. Otherwise, I get bored. So feel free to ask questions. You can put them in the chat window. You can raise your hand. You can do whatever. Disclosures for this, we have none. So the outline, quick breakdown of what we're going to do. <clears throat> it is a few case presentations. It's a review and background of how to think about looking at a shoulder, some options for treatment, uh, some then we can take some questions. And of course, like anything else, there's a big finisher or a little dessert for the end of Lunch and Learn. So case examples, we're gonna start very simple. These are all examples of things that most of us have seen in the office at one point or another. So case number one, we've got a 56 year old guy. He's a truck mechanic. He has a previous history of a massive cuff tear. It was fixed arthroscopically by one of our orthopedic surgeons here. These are little anchors that show that he had a cuff repair at some point. He shows up in the office with complaints of increased pain and pseudoparalysis. For those of you who don't know what pseudoparalysis is, it's the inability to lift your arm and it's because of a mechanical problem, not a nerve problem. So when you have those patients who come in and they can't lift their arm, you ask them to reach their face or get their arm up overhead and they do this. Um, so pseudoparalysis means that they can't lift their arm up and there's usually a mechanical reason why, usually indicating a massive cuff tear. So case number two is an 80 year old retired professor no previous injury, he's got chronic shoulder pain, nothing happened, it's just kind of developed over time. He can get his arm to shoulder height, he's got some weakness taking things out of the cabinet, so he's really adapted to doing things below the shoulder. In this case, when you look at his x-ray, you can see the side of the shoulder blade is right here, or the scapula. Here's the medial border of the humerus, and they don't line up anymore. So this is called the Gothic arch. This arch and this arch should line up. If you see a disruption here, that means the ball is high in the socket and that's usually indicative of a rotator cuff tear, usually a chronic rotator cuff tear. So, so far two patients, both with shoulder pain, different problems. Case three, this is a 75 year old New Hampshire farmer. The guy's very busy. He's got 75 acres of property that he takes care of himself. He moves boulders around his backyard. He knocks down trees, he plows, he does everything. Both of his shoulders are killing him. He's been able to continue to do his work. His strength is there, but he can't lift his arms up anymore. He's noticed a loss of motion, a loss of function, and he's, he's pretty frustrated with it. Oh, so sorry about that. So if you look at this one, in this case, here's the humeral head, here's the glenoid, and now you can see a little bone spur here, a little bone spur here. So again, shoulder pain, loss of motion, difficulty with function, different problems. And finally, we have a 68 year old retired hospital employee who unfortunately, she slipped on her stairs landing on the left shoulder. So she shows up in the emergency room and gets referred to us because she's got shoulder pain and can't lift it and it's bruised and she was told she had a broken shoulder. So you look at this case and here's the socket 
and here's the shaft of the humerus, but the head is pretty much smushed. It looks like if you have the ice cream on the ice cream cone that you push the scoop down to be able to put more ice cream on top. So again, four patients, all shoulder problems, all very different. So what's the point of all of this? There's different pathology, different demands, and we have to figure out what to do for all of them. So what do we do? How do we approach this? So how I think about the shoulder is that you have to identify the problem first. You listen to your patients. They really tell you what the problem is. They tell you what's wrong and what you need to start thinking about. Is this a functional problem? Is this a mechanical problem? Is there a big issue that they can't reach overhead to take things out of the cabinet or they can't wash their face or they can't feed themselves or do they not have any strength and they can't do their activities of daily living? Is this a new problem versus a, a, an old problem? Is it acute versus chronic? Did they fall or did something, uh, has this been ongoing for a while? And one important question to ask is, can they live with it? Is this something that they're here because they wanna know what's going on? Is this something they really wanna address? So a quick and added review, I'm, I'm sorry, this is when all the cameras are gonna go dark and people are gonna start paying attention. The shoulder is a ball and socket joint. And the reason why this is important is because there's two types of motion in the shoulder. Part of it comes from the ball and socket. So here's the humeral head and here's the glenoid. And part of it comes from the scapulothoracic joint, which is the shoulder blade on the rib cage. Now this is important because the subscapularis, the rotator cuff in the front, attaches to this bump, the lesser tuberosity, and the other three rotator cuff tendons attach to this bump called the greater tuberosity. The biceps tendon runs in between the two. So if you're having trouble visualizing that, we can always refer to Netter um, or whomever drew this one. So we've got the subscapularis in the front, and this is the lesser tuberosity. This is the supraspinatus, which is the rotator cuff on top, which attaches to the greater tuberosity. Now, a view from the back, you can see the infraspinatus and teres minor. And for those who are curious, the supra is named because it lives above the spine and the infraspinatus is named because it lives below the spine. So all of this is important because this helps us determine how we're treating people with shoulder arthropathy. There are different surgical procedures and the presence of an intact rotator cuff and a functional rotator cuff help us decide what we're doing for people. So why does anatomy matter? It's really the shoulder mechanics of the shoulder. Oh, shoulder mechanics of the shoulder, that makes sense. So we've got the deltoid, which is what allows you to lift your shoulder up overhead, but the rotator cuff is what centers the ball in the socket. And when you have a disruption in the rotator cuff and you no longer have the humeral head getting compressed into the glenoid, the deltoid can't function. So the deltoid cannot pull the arm up to a position where it can lift overhead if the rotator cuff doesn't initiate movement. So if you think about it, when that cuff fires, it initiates movement to a point where your arm starts to abduct, and then the deltoid takes over, and that's what allows your arm to go up overhead. If the rotator cuff does not do that, then the pull of the deltoid just pulls your shoulder up and down. It doesn't do anything else. So what does this have to do with a shoulder replacement, and why do we care? <clears throat> if you have an intact rotator cuff, we can do a total shoulder. So this is an anatomic shoulder replacement. It looks just like it did before surgery, except it's now metal and plastic. So this functions like a normal shoulder. It works like a normal shoulder. It looks like a normal shoulder. On this side, which is called a reverse total shoulder, it looks quite different than, than the picture on the left. So the ball is now where the socket used to be, and the socket is now where the ball used to be. And the reason for this is that it is relying on the deltoid. This gives a mechanical advantage for your shoulder to function by using the deltoid without having a rotator cuff. So this brings us to treatment options. So you have somebody in your office, they've got shoulder pain, you get an x-ray, <clears throat> it demonstrates arthritis or chronic rotator cuff tear or some other shoulder arthropathy. And how do you manage that? What do you do for these patients? So you can start simple, you can do lifestyle changes. If it hurts to do overhead stuff, you don't do overhead stuff. If you don't have the strength to take the pots and pans out of the cabinet overhead, you put the pots and pans below the cabinet. People can function below their shoulder. So if they can change what they're doing and they can manage it and they can live with it, that's great. You can try physical therapy. So if this is a cuff tear or a chronic cuff tear, if you can retrain the shoulder muscles around the shoulder, meaning the periscapular muscles, the muscles around the shoulder blade, sometimes you can improve their motion and improve their function for them to be able to get their arm up overhead or at least get it to a position where they can feed themselves and take care of themselves. Medications such as uh, 
NSAIDs and Tylenol work. The combination of Advil or Aleve with Tylenol provides better pain relief than narcotics. So that's certainly a way to go if you're trying to help somebody manage pain. And finally, you can try injections. With glenohumeral arthritis, where the rotator cuff is intact, <clears throat> we usually opt for an intraarticular injection, which is done through radiology. And the reason for that is, is that the injection has to go into the joint. If the cuff is okay, giving a subacromial injection doesn't get to the joint and doesn't provide relief. If somebody has a rotator cuff tear or a rotator cuff tear arthropathy, meaning arthritis from having a cuff tear, a subacromial injection will do just fine. And the reason for that is, is because that is now one space. The subacromial space and the glenohumeral space, meaning this space up here and this space here are now contiguous. So with a cuff tear, these are now one space. With an intact cuff, they're two separate spaces. If the thing to keep in mind is that none of these are permanent solutions. So you can offer pain relief, you can help with their function, you can hopefully get them to a point where they're comfortable. But if this doesn't get them where they want, then we can talk about surgery. And there are really three primary procedures. The, the point of today's talk is to focus on the first two. So it's a primary total shoulder replacement and a reverse total shoulder. Humeral head resurfacing is uh, something that was in vogue a while ago. We still do it in limited cases, but really the benefit of humeral head resurfacing now is that we have moved away to, uh, we've moved from total shoulders to stemless shoulder replacement. Um, and, and we'll touch on this briefly just so you have the information, but really the focus is the first two. So when you have these patients in your office, what imaging do we do? So the first thing, as we saw in those first four cases, is x-rays. The x-rays tell you a lot of information, and you can really make a good, good decision about what you think the problem is based on the imaging that we have. If your patients have continued functional deficits, if they have pain, if they can't live with it, then I usually get an MRI. And the MRI gives us a lot of information. So Dr. Foster gave a lecture two weeks ago, and that was focusing on uh, looking at an MRI for rotator cuff pathology. So we're not gonna show a lot of images about what a cuff tear looks like, but one thing that he did bring up was this image here. So this is a sagittal view of a shoulder. So what you see here is the shoulder blade. So this is the spine of the scapula. This is the body of the scapula. And this is the supraspinatus, again, above the spine, the infraspinatus, which is below the spine, and the subscapularis, which lives under the scapula. And the reason why this view is important, which you know kind of looks like a T-bone steak, is because these all have a significant amount of white around the gray. This gray is muscle. This white is fat. So when you look at a shoulder and we look at the quality of the muscle, if the, when the muscle starts to look like this, when you see almost as much fat as muscle or the same with this and fat infiltrating here, this tells us that this rotator cuff is not compliant and it may not be fixable. And this is probably a chronic problem. So once we make a decision about the quality of the rotator cuff, that points us towards what kind of surgery to do. Is this a shoulder replacement, be it a reverse or a total? The other thing that we sometimes look at is a CAT scan. And the reason why we get CAT scans is to look if there's bone loss because that helps with surgical planning. This image over here is a, it's a reconstruction. This was a surgical plan for doing a reverse total shoulder. So this is the body of the scapula here. This is a, a cartoon of the implant that we're putting in. And this big gap here is missing bone. So this is somebody who needed to have a reconstruction with bone graft because we had to make up this huge deficit. It is hard to see this kind of a deficit on an MRI, so a CT scan yields some information for that. But when you're in the office, if you have somebody that you're concerned about why they can't lift their shoulder, the first step would be an MRI because that'll give you information if it's a rotator cuff tear and the chronicity of the rotator cuff. So when we've tried everything else and all else has failed, we have shoulder arthroplasty as an option. So degenerative disease makes up the majority of the reason why we do shoulder uh, shoulder replacements, trauma makes up about 40%. So in this top image here, you can see again, here's the humeral head, here's the glenoid, and that's a disrupted arch. So this tells us that this is a chronic cuff tear and this is someone who would probably do well with a reverse total shoulder. 
This one is a shoulder that was plated. So this was a humeral, uh, proximal humerus fracture and the plate is fine. It's in a good position, but you can see the head's collapsed a little bit and they're getting some uh, post-traumatic arthritis. So in a case like this, this is someone who also could benefit from a shoulder replacement because they're having pain or a disability or a lack of motion resulting from the fact that they broke their shoulder and either their rotator cuff isn't functioning, the mechanics of the shoulder have changed or they're developing some arthritis. So, this was an interesting slide. There's a lot of information on it. You, you don't have to take in everything. The key point on this is that from 2019 projected to through 2026, there is a compound annual growth rate of almost 8%. So this is, that's all the time we have folks. Bear with me for a second. There we go. Um, so this tells us that the amount of shoulder replacements that are being done is only going up over the next few years. Um, I've given this talk or a similar talk in the past, and this was originally looking at 2004 through 2020, and it was a very similar growth rate. And this is important because we all send our patients to our, our uh, knee and hip specialists and knee and hip replacements are a huge volume of surgery in this hospital system and if, in any hospital system for that matter. And shoulder replacement is, is not quite there yet as far as volume, but it, we're, we're gaining a lot of momentum. There are a lot of patients with shoulder problems that would benefit from having a shoulder replacement. So shoulder arthritis, just a quick overview of it, is just basically a worn out shoulder. So when you look at it, the ball and socket don't quite look normal anymore. This is a loss of a joint space. This is a big bone spur. If you're having trouble seeing that on the x-ray, the little cartoon shows you that there's quite a bit of disease. This is all worn out shoulder and it's not working the way it's supposed to. Same thing over here. You can see big bone spurs and a loss of joint space. So patients complain of pain, stiffness. They don't have any motion. They have difficulty lifting their arm up. They have crepitus or crunching when they move. And it could be related to any number of things. Osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, avascular necrosis. And again, previous surgery, be it instability, for instance, or any fracture work. Total shoulder arthroplasty addresses this. So a total shoulder arthroplasty is typically an anatomic uh, shoulder replacement. So compared to what you see in a normal shoulder, this looks very similar. So we've recon uh, reconstructed the ball so you can see the arches maintained again, the Gothic arches intact here, and there's a joint space. What you don't see on the x-ray, but you can tell from this little line here is that there's a piece of plastic here that is making up the joint. So you have a metal ball and a piece of plastic. So that's depicted over here in the cartoon where you've got the metal ball. This is the stem, very much like this. And this is a piece of plastic and this recreates the joint. So you have a metal ball articulating with a plastic socket. And this is what alleviates our patient's pain and helps them move their shoulders. There have been a number of studies that have looked at patient outcomes for this. And one of the most important things that we've found is that at 10 years, there's a 93% survivorship. That means that people 10 years in after a shoulder replacement, 93% of them are still doing well and they're having good motion and pain relief, which is fantastic. 83% of patients at 12 years are still having uh, relief from moderate to severe pain. They improve their motion, they improve their function and they have decreased pain. So this is why we do these operations. Now to, to switch over to reverse shoulder arthroplasty, it's biomechanically a little bit different. Now it's still a shoulder replacement, but the goal for this is to address people who have non-functional rotator cuffs. So this has been around in Europe for a really long time. And we really started to gain some traction with this in the United States in 2004. And our indications have changed quite a bit. When we first started doing these, they were for people 72 years old and older with chronic rotator cuff tears who couldn't lift their arm. And the indications have changed. We now do it for failed total shoulders. We do it for uh, complex uh, shoulder issues. We do it for proximal humerus fractures. And it has really like been a, a wonderful uh, thing that we've been able to do to help, help patients who really didn't have any other options prior to. So a reverse total shoulder is biomechanically different than a shoulder replacement. So again, here's the ball, which was where the socket used to be, and here's the, the socket. Now this is a 155 degree stem. It's not quite what we do today. Now we use 135 degrees. But the point of this is that you can see the ball and the socket and the cartoon matches. So you can really see it on an x-ray form and in a, in a cartoon to be able to understand how the two of them work and how the deltoid is really what's responsible for lifting the arm of overhead. 
the shoulder reverse shoulder arthroplasty relies on the deltoid. So that's why it doesn't need to have uh, an intact rotator cuff. By changing the pull of the shoulder, you can use the deltoid uh, to be able to lift the arm up overhead. So it really changes the shoulder to a fulcrum. So again, what happens is, is that as you fire the deltoid, which attaches on this bump here, it's able to rotate around the ball, which allows people to lift their arm to the side and lift it up overhead. So this is a quick little uh, video. This is a lady who could not lift her arm over her head. We don't actually need to listen to me talking, so we can probably mute that. Um, so this is uh, six weeks after a shoulder replacement, and she couldn't lift it at all. So this is a reverse total shoulder for someone with true pseudo paralysis. She can get to the back of her head. She can wash her face. She could do everything that she was unable to do before. And the and this is important. This is somebody who's in their mid eighties who was completely. Uh, could not do any of the activities of daily living that she needed to. So reverse total shoulder has also been started to be used for fracture. So we're using it for people who break their shoulder. So before we used to do hemiarthroplasties, which is a half a shoulder replacement, and that really relied on the tuberosities to heal. So if the tuberosities don't heal, the cuff doesn't function. If the cuff doesn't function, you've got a nice piece of metal in somebody's shoulder and they can't lift their arm up overhead. So that wasn't really a great surgery and there was, it was time dependent. We needed to get these patients in before things started to heal. The benefit of doing a reverse now is you don't have to push somebody to do an operation. You can leave them alone, you can let them sit, you can give them the option to see how they do. And if at six weeks, three months, six months, a year, they can't lift their arm up overhead or they're still unhappy, we can still do a reverse. They didn't burn any bridges. And, and that's important because it, it's no longer something that's an emergency to take care of a broken shoulder. We can really give some patients the, the option to, to see how they do. So again, when you've got a broken shoulder, this is disrupted and we can do a reverse for this and this really re reliably restores function. So a quick talk on a, a, the humeral head resurfacing. Once upon a time, we were using this just to cover the articular surface. This year, there have been, and last year, there have been a number of companies in the US who are now doing stemless shoulder replacements. So this screw here, is now a stemless design. So you can see that it takes a lot less bone, but this is a stemless total shoulder. So they still have a shoulder replacement. They have the humeral head redone and they don't have a big metal stem in the shoulder. So this is great for younger people. It really saves bone. And this is really the direction that we're going in with shoulder replacements. Um, and it's, it's, it's been wonderful. The bleeding time, the bleeding is less, the surgical time is less um, and patients do really well with this. So this is, this is new in the past year or two in the United States. So complications, well, of course, bad things happen to everyone, right? So shoulder complication rate is for totals is between 10 and 16%. Reverse the complication rates 15%. Initially it was reported as much higher, but as people are getting better at these, that complication rate drops. This one here is a periprosthetic fracture, meaning you can still see the stem and that's a nice big crack. So that had to get fixed with a plate. This is somebody that I saw here within my first few months of practice who had this done at one of the, uh, an outside hospital and they came in a week after surgery and we're in the ICU and you can see that the socket is pointing towards the sky. I mean, the ball is pointing towards the sky. That, that doesn't quite look like this. So this has already failed. And this is somebody that I saw who had a total shoulder done. And you can imagine that the ball lines up very nicely here, but we left the whole back of the, the humerus uncovered. So these have to be done well for them to work. So key success factors, what do we have to get right to make this work? <clears throat> you need to have good bone. You need to recognize the pathology. You have to determine the quality of the rotator cuff. And importantly, you really have to have appropriate indications. And all of this is important uh, to have the best outcome for your patients. Now, one important point is that Shoulder specialists do a lot of these, general orthopedists don't. And that's not to say that people can't do the operation, but the more you do, the better your outcomes are. So 75% of shoulder replacements are being performed by people who really only do one or two of them a year. Now, going back and looking at that, those complications, you can imagine that people who do more of them have better results. So part of that is getting access to the glenoid. So getting access to the socket, you can imagine from those x-rays, the ball and socket are perfectly lined up on, a, on an AP view, but on the lateral view, they're sitting like this. You have to get the humeral head out of the way to get to the socket. So there's, there's uh, a lot of technique that you need to be able to have to be able to do this successfully and give patients good outcomes. And the reason why that's important is because there is a direct correlation between volume and complication. So people who do more have a lower post-op complication rate than those who do less. 
So overall patient satisfaction, 99% of people who have a shoulder replacement for arthritis wish they had it done sooner. And it's great that we can give patients this option. I ask all of my patients after a shoulder replacement how they did with pain management and all of them, for the, well, the majority of them, take very little narcotic pain medication after surgery. They tell me that you know they took Tylenol or Advil and the pain that they had after surgery is so minimal compared to what they had before that they're very happy they had it done. So if we take a quick jump back into our case presentations, Here's our 50 year old, our 56 year old right hand uh, dominant uh, truck mechanic with his rotator cuff. So you can see the cuff is torn. Based on the amount of wasting, there's a lot of fat and very little muscle. So this is someone who does very well with a reverse total shoulder. If we go to our 80 year old right hand uh, retired professor, he also has a cuff tear. He also has a little bit of atrophy but he's fine. He's happy with the way things are going. He had a cortisone shot. He's managing. He's okay with the way things are. He didn't need anything further. Our 75 year old New Hampshire farmer with his arthritis, people whose shoulders look like this have intact rotator cuffs. So he's got a nice intact rotator cuff. He's got no wasting whatsoever of his rotator cuff muscle. So he's got a new shoulder in there and he's back to doing the things that he loves. And then finally, our poor lady who fell down the stairs and broke her shoulder. There's not a very big head fragment here. That's not fixable. There's no room to put screws in. You can see that on the axial images as well. So she has a reverse total shoulder and she has her tuberosity fixed and she can lift her arm up overhead. So four different patients, four different pathology and they all did great. So that's a quick run through of this. We have a number of people over at Newton Wellesley Sports Medicine that you can see. We've got Bobby Nascimento. He is uh, sports medicine trained. He does shoulder replacements. He does complex knee surgery, and he's here if you need him. We've got Drew Rogers, also sports medicine trained. He is our hip preservation specialist, so he takes care of hip scopes. He's here to help, uh, help take care of our patients who aren't ready for hip replacements. Me, you probably don't need to hear anything else. And for those of you who remember the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, who is the leader of the pack? Well, Dr. Tim Foster. So this is our crew over at Newton Wellesley. You can see any of us. Now a quick word from our sponsor. So this is our little dessert for your lunch and learn. We are starting a walk-in care, a walk-in clinic over at 978 Worcester Street. That's right on the well, uh, Wellesley Natick line. This is a picture of our beautiful building over there. We are there uh, soon to be seven days a week. So for all of those patients that you have at quarter of five, when you're trying to figure out where to send them and everybody's office is closing, we're open from eight to eight, Monday through Friday. No appointment is necessary. If you call us, we will get them in and we will also be offering hours from eight to one on Saturday and Sunday. So that's going to be staffed by an orthopedic PA. You will have backup from either me or Drew or Bobby or Tim. We have x-ray and casting as well as bracing on site. And our plan is to get this going in, uh, in January. So for contact info, we're over at Blue 423 in the main hospital. We're at 978 Worcester Street where the walk-in clinic is. Here's our phone number and that's my email address. If you have questions, if you have concerns, if you can't get a patient in to see me, email me, I'll get them in. Thanks Jay. <clears throat> John Snyder coming back on. Great talk, really, really interesting. Also about getting, getting in touch with these guys, of course, uh, using the uh, referral and Epic and choosing Newton Wellesley Sports Medicine is always a very nice way of getting in touch with them. They'll get right back to your patient. Uh, we have two minutes for questions. I don't see anything in the box. Um, one of the things that patients always ask me about the shoulder replacements, first of all, should I get it done? But second is, what's the recovery period like? And I know what rotator cuff surgery looks like from recovery period. Does it look somewhat similar, Jay? It's different for totals versus prime, uh, for reverses. So somebody who has a total shoulder, in order to get into the joint, we have to cut the subscap. So the rotator cuff gets cut in the front for us to be able to gain access to the joint. So the rehab afterwards is to protect the cuff. So the pain level is different. People do very well with the rehab, but we usually put them in a sling for six weeks to protect the uh, subscap while it heals. They still get started with physical therapy. They get started with range of motion, but we need that subscap to heal. For reverses, completely different. If it's a reverse for fracture, it's going to be the four to six weeks in a sling while we wait for the uh, tuberosities to start to heal because we need the bone healing in that case. 
But for a primary reverse, for somebody with a cuff tear arthropathy, we get them out of the sling and moving very, very quickly. And as soon as they have deltoid control, they can start using their shoulder with nothing heavier than a cup of coffee or a glass of wine. Wow. Uh, uh, Kay Thompson wants to know, how long does a shoulder replacement last and what can be done if it wears out? So for a total shoulder, um, if we go back to that slide that we saw a little while ago, the longevity of these, it's, it's about 93% survivorship at 10 years. So 10 to 12 years, people are still doing very well. Even at 12 years, we have over 85% of these are still in place. So the goal of these is to give people their function back when they're younger. So pushing people off until they're older is no longer something that we do. Um, when they wear out, so if somebody had a total shoulder and they did great and things start to wear out, depending on what wears out uh, helps you decide what surgery to do. So the great thing about a reverse is that when a total shoulder wears out, you can take the original components out and you can change it to a reverse if it's a cuff tear problem, if there's bone loss or if the components are loose. Does that answer it? Yeah, I think so. What about, is, are these day procedures mostly? I try not to operate at night anymore. I'm getting too old. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're, they're, uh, so these are procedures that insurance hasn't really adopted or adapted too much to allow us to send patients home. So it's something we would like to work on in the future here. But currently what we do is patients will come in in the morning. Uh, we typically do a nerve block with an on-cue pump. That's a pump that has um, a catheter gets left in place with a pin ball. And that keeps a block going for about four days. We admit them overnight um, so we can check on them in the morning. Uh, occupational therapy will show them how to manage the sling, how to get dressed, all of those things, and usually get them out by about noon, one o'clock the following day. Um, patients do, do great with it. The blood loss for a primary is usually between about 150 and 200 cc's. Um, for those of you following at home, a can of Coke is about 360 cc's, so it's, it's half a can of soda. Great. Yeah, people, my patients as well, especially with the rotator cuff, they love that pump. I mean, it's no narcotics at all. By the time you pull it out, they're good. It's been a game changer. It is. It, the, these are really becoming surgeries where they're not getting much narcotic, if any at all. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, uh, it's one o'clock, so we're 101. So I'll let everyone get back to their afternoon sessions. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Simon. Thanks for the great talk. Informative as always. Uh, wishing everybody a great holiday next week, whatever that looks like in 2020. And we'll be back the following Thursday to learn about breast implants. Um, I'll, this will be on the on the web as well. Oh, I didn't type it in, but it's H-O-P-T-O-H for the um, uh, CME, H-O-P-T-O-H. I was too enthralled with Dr. J Dr. Simon's talk to remember to put the CME code. And anyway, and look forward to our urgent care walk-in orthopedics. Thanks. Orthopedics to be opening up at the beginning of the year. We're very excited about that program as well at 978 Worcester Street. Um, everyone have a great week and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye.